So let's talk a little bit about sandbagging. Sandbagging is a meme that has permeated the Twitter sphere whenever someone brings up an LPL team or a Chinese team, the word sandbagging is sure to fall in some reason or the other. It's not dissimilar to the Night Cafe teams in that there was some basis for the meme to begin, but at the same time it doesn't encompass as much. And it's it's fun to use these memes like the term and exaggerate it beyond recognition. Like that's how people in esports seem to have fun. So I take no issue with sandbagging becoming a meme. The issue I take with it is the source of the meme and where it came from and the fact that it pretty much like every time it brings it up it serves to discredit people like me who follow the LPL scene and try to analyze the games. And it also, not only that, but the origin of the meme comes from a clip in which Monte Cristo pretty much more or less says that all LPL experts say the same things or talk the same way. First of all, I don't really typically call myself an LPL expert, I call myself an LPL enthusiast or someone who follows the LPL because I, I think the term expert is very is very heavy. Like may, People might think of me as one, but uh, there's still a lot of stuff that I don't know, other things. But back to the topic at hand, which is in relation to the sandbagging. So let's start off by talking a little bit about how we define sandbagging. The definition of sandbagging is pretty much to underperform or to not show your full level. And the way that a lot of people think about sandbagging might be in terms of a sport where someone plays without using like some of their faculties. Like you decide to skip in a soccer field instead of running or things like that. Just ways that you can sort of inhibit yourself where it seems like maybe you're still trying to win but you're not giving your full force or what you really could give in order to perhaps win the game. And in some games, sometimes sandbagging extends so far as to, like, you're actually actively trying to lose. Um, I think that's another implication that's used a lot. So when you talk about sandbagging, you have to be aware of that second implication. And I usually am when I talk about it, so I'm not going to use it unless I think that there's a possibility that there's an incentive in a match to lose. Not necessarily that they're trying to lose, but that there is that incentive and that it does exist. So now that we've kind of established the definition of sandbagging that I'm going to be using or that has been used, I'm going to show you the origin or the clip from an episode of Summoning Insight with a special guest, League of Emily, from which it originated. I mean, there's a, there's a fundamental problem with saying they're experimenting. How do you know they are experimenting? This is one of the great fallacies that the, the LPL lovers go to that I find very problematic. There are two things that piss me the fuck off about people who talk about the LPL. One, sandbagging. Two, experimenting. Why See, are you, I actually, why I actually are you experimenting that. in professional play? How do you know it's experimenting instead of just being bad? Uh, aside from the part of the episode where Monte Cristo uh, starts laughing and says, do you even listen to yourself uh, in relation to one of Emily's points about Chowgu? This is probably the harshest part, or, and by harsh I don't mean like, oh, he's mean or whatever. It's just probably the, the most, the strongest statement against what he's talking about. Let's put it that way. And I think Monte Cristo is very smart, and he has a lot of points, and actually, to, to get to this, I uh, the big premise of this video is mostly that I don't necessarily disagree with a lot of the points that he's making. It's just that he seems to be under the impression that the majority of people who follow the LPL do disagree with most of his points, or that all they do is say that a team is sandbagging if they do underperform in a game, or if they do play poorly in a game. And that's not something that I typically do. Uh, he also talked about experimenting in the beginning of this rant, and that's something that I'm going to address a little bit later on, but since it's it's much less of the meme than, I guess, the overarching sandbagging thing, uh, I'm not going to talk about it as much. First of all, it's important to, to note that Emily doesn't mention sandbagging. He's the first one to bring it up, so she's not saying that I think Chowgu was sandbagging in this instance. This isn't... He, she didn't bring up sandbagging in relation to Chowgu, so I don't think she meant it at all. Um, typically when I talk about sandbagging, I'm not going to talk about the other ones because it, other people who follow the LPL, because again, a big thing I want to emphasize here is that we're not all the same person. And it's possible that Monty uh, was talking to someone who, else who follows the LPL, like I'm not privy to all of his conversations, who was saying that all Chinese teams, when Chinese teams play bag, badly, it's just because they're sandbagging. 
or something like that, who, who was using this kind of heavy-handed approach. The point I'm making here, though, is that we don't all use the same analysis, and when I use the term sandbagging personally, I don't refer to every game where an LPL team does poorly. Usually, the last time I actually talked about sandbagging was in an article I wrote about uh, LGD, which I'm actually going to go ahead and bring up here. Here's the, the last time I really talked about sandbagging, and when I mentioned sandbagging, I said, then there's sandbagging. And the title of this article, just so people know, is How Amateur Jungler Shaoxi Can Make LGD a World Championship Team. The background of this article was mostly to discuss the problems LGD had been having and the things that they would have needed to fix to become world champions. Of course, I later on, after seeing their great performance against EDG, retracted that a little bit because one of my big things was get rid of TBQ, replace him with Shaoxi. Um, but the the premise of this article is actually to talk mostly about the flaws that LGD has and the, the problems that I thought were they could overcome but and then still be strong so this part of the article discusses why I think that despite the fact that at the time they were rated really really lowly at the LPL and I mentioned things about coaching stuff I mentioned things about PYL having had to repair his jaw. I remember mentioned a lot of things and I only mentioned sandbagging briefly. I just say, then there's sandbagging. Last split, LGD placed six in the regular season. They played with outlandish champion picks, ignored dragons, and picked unnecessary fights as if they were trying to lose games. So here I'm not even relate talking about LGD in the summer split. I'm talking about something that happened in spring split. They go on and say, well, there's no direct evidence that, LP that LGD tried to lose their games. The format of the Springs playoffs encouraged LGD to try to drop for a lower seed. Now, even Monty himself has sort of, you know, con conceded to this. He said that, yeah, I think that there's evidence to say that there was an incentive for teams to drop to a lower seed. Him and Thorin talked about this on the Summoning Insight, and specific games would be the Oscar night, where LGD and IG had ridiculous amounts of kills, and on Papa Smithy's, one of his first appearances, I think it was his first, it may not have been though, but it was one of his really, really early appearances in OGN casting, he and Monty talk about this, uh, I guess, Oscar night, where IG and LGD both had really high kill count. So he asks, how do you know when a team is experimenting? How do you know when a team is sandbagging? Things like that. This is an example of it, and him and Monty, him and Papa Smithy actually make the points for me. I liked the the Oscar night where no one wanted dragons. That was the best one. And that was see, that's I stood the over one hundred watching kill that game. particular game. And I sat down with uh, one of the other casters, and I was like, okay, how do you know that this game people aren't necessarily taking it very seriously? And, and the instant answers are, oh, there's a bard in the game. Uh, some of the non-meta picks, I think Karthus top in that game, all sorts of crazies. I was like, okay, look at the timer, and it was like 35 minutes into the game, there was zero dragons. None. <laughs> so, I'm pretty sure dragons are quite an important part of League of Legends. In fact, the early games become so much more important this season, because you have to control that objective, or give it up and take Baron at 22 minutes if you're some teams. No dragons at 35 minutes, probably a little sign there. Right, not only that, but just the... Just the <laughs> The number, the sheer volume of kills in that game, a little bit of a tip off as well. So let's just outline the format of the tournament that existed. Here we have the format for the spring season playoffs, and these were a bracket stage, quarterfinals to finals with third place match, all best of five. The way it was set out was you had first seed, uh, as in the first seed would face eighth in the first quarterfinal, then you would have Third seed face fourth in the second quarterfinal. You would have second seed face seventh seed in the second in the next quarterfinal, and then you would have Owen third and sixth seed face each other in the last quarterfinal. The reason why this format encouraged sandbagging is because if you're a good team, okay, your option and you face EDG in either the semifinals or the quarterfinals, you're going to get significantly less circuit points than you're going to get if you make the finals, okay? So everyone kind of assumed that EDG was winning because they lost five games in a total 44 game season or something like that. They were extremely dominating. So everyone felt like the objective of the regular season was to avoid EDG in brackets. Now, 
to do that, you would have to get, to make it so that you would only face EDG in final, you would either get second place, seventh place, sixth place, or sixth place, or third place. So it was a lot easier to shoot for seventh place or sixth place than it was to shoot for sixth, second place, or GD had trouble. They were fourth place for a long time, and fourth place is really unideal. Uh, VG Gaming, IG faced each other, Invictus Gaming knocked out 3-0 in the semifinals. So LG decided to cut their losses. They started playing really ridiculous things in games. The Oscar Knight wasn't the only weird set. They had really weird one-off plays. There was a set against Vici where Acorn played top lane Galio, the only time the entire year where he played top lane Galio, despite him playing it at Worlds. Uh, Misfortune and Ash were both played, despite the fact that no one else in LPL Spring played those champions. There was also this set where Flame was playing, and TBQ on screen locks in Kha'Zix, and he's laughing, and Flame hits him jokingly, and then TBQ is laughing more. Like, it doesn't seem like these guys are taking these games extremely seriously, and they're playing like these really strange picks. Um, so to me, that shows I'm with the incentive and this other information, this is grounds to actually suspect that these teams were sandbagging. And there's actually a rumor that has some good supporting evidence that, you know, Lace was actually investigating, Lace and Riot were actually investigating them for the possibility that they weren't playing games very seriously. So it wasn't just us who thought that, it was people who are actually running the league thought that maybe LGD was sandbagging. LPL would eventually change their format, but not until week 7 of LPL Summer, so that there was more of an incentive to place higher, and you didn't have teams aiming for the 6th and 7th seed. We saw evidence of this in the Summer Split, where teams like Master 3 and OMG, which were placed up in the six, in the top 6, in top 5, in week 6 and 7, suddenly start to lose ground. Um, in week 7, after the change was announced, Master 3 falls to 4th place, then, following that, Master 3 falls to 6th place in Week 8, Master 3 falls to 7th place in Week 9, and is in 8th place in Week 10. Master 3 was never a good team. The fact that they were up at the top, near the top, uh, and tied for 3rd in Week 6 just is really, really strange. Because no one at the time ever thought that Master 3 was actually like that strong of a team. So seeing them up there was a question mark, and the fact that as soon as they change the format, they start to drop is pretty indicative that teams were responding to the format change. Uh, also, LGD started to rise up, as you can kind of see, in, in Week 7, weeks, Week 8. Um, and then finally, you had the... the inst in the Week 10, they didn't really play many games, so they got overcame, but just you see the trends where the teams that you would expect to be higher up after the format change start to rise and the teams that you expect to be lower down after the format change start to drop. So this idea that teams are playing for a certain seed or had an incentive to play for a lower seed actually is supported by more than just LTG's performances in the spring, end of the spring season problem with China is that the regular season is absolutely ridiculous and not indicative of the team's strengths whatsoever. Now, let's talk about experimenting, which to reiterate was actually the thing that Emily brought up. She never really accused any teams of sandbagging per se. She just talked about Chaogu being experimental. I think that, first of all, when you say experimenting, you're not necessarily talking about something extremely calculated. I don't think you... There, anyone who said that these LPL teams are extremely calculated going into every game, you'd be laughed at. No one says that. That's ridiculous. Why would we ever fucking say that? Oh my god. Anyway, the point is, is that when you say experimenting, we mean something like maybe a pick that you wouldn't always choose, and you're just feeling like, okay, why not? Let's just let's just throw it in there. We have 44 games regular season. There's there's no harm in playing it right now. In fact, uh, when I interviewed Godway, he would say things like rely on scrim results, and that's why we're more inclined to pick more experimental things in LPL regular season. So, so Godway, the player, actually said that. And it wasn't just him, okay, it was EDG's manager. Sancho said initially that the reason why EDG only scrimmed LSPL teams is because he felt like LPL teams didn't scrim very seriously, so LSPL teams still wanted to learn. And this was a big flaw that LPL has always had. And I didn't bring it up in predicting LPL results at the World Championship because it's, it's never really inhibited them from placing uh, top four or whatever at the World Championship before. So I think that it's worth 
noting that th there's evidence to support the idea that scrum culture isn't that great, so they are more likely to experiment because they actually say this. And, and sure, they could be lying, they could be pulling the wool over our eyes, uh, but this, this is something that's actually supported with evidence. And the idea itself that um, teams in really, really long seasons aren't inclined to experiment at all is kind of uh, something that uh, th that's not like even a claim that's necessarily useful to make because even LCK teams have done this. Uh, LCK, this league that teams will pick one-off things occasionally when they think that they're just so far ahead. For example, SKT is the very, very obvious point when you make is you talk about Master E. And I actually had a Twitter conversation where, with Monte Cristo where uh, I mentioned that people reacted differently when LPL picked Master Yi to when LCK picked Master Yi, and he said, well, can't we just agree that it was shit in both cases? And it's like, yeah, yeah, I, absolutely, I, that, that's how I provide it as an affirmative. I think that the pick is shit in both cases, but I don't think that either LPL or LCK was picking it like extremely seriously. They were taking a more experimental approach. You can say that, okay, they actually really thought it was good and then it wasn't, but still, they, they did an experiment, it turned out to be not that great, they decided not to do it again. This is, this is all I mean when I say experimenting. Now, the topic that Emily and Monty talk about is a little bit more sensitive. They talk about how Emily thought that Chao Gu was intentionally uh, putting themselves into disadvantageous lane swaps to practice lane swapping in bad situations or just lane swapping in general. I don't, this was something that we had come up with kind of as a possible idea. I don't know if I necessarily personally agree with it, um, but it's something that I had talked about with her, so I know a little bit about her thought process going into this. Now, the evidence to kind of support that Chaogu did this, she goes into a little bit, but she doesn't back it up necessarily with statistics, which is what I'm going to do a little bit here. First of all, uh, Chaogu, they have this reputation for being the team that split the most in LPL, which also isn't accurate. Beachy Gaming, probably the most... Uh, them or, them or LGD were probably the most methodical or the most strategy-based teams in LPL. Uh, actually, went 1-1 the most, okay? Uh, Chao Gu didn't go 1-1 more than, like, at least half of the teams in the LPL had similar 1-1 record numbers than they did. But when you look at these 1-1s, you see that there is actually a tendency for them to win the second game more often. When they do the split, they have twice as many times where they win the second game after losing the first than they do of losing the second game after winning the first. This just means that maybe Chaogu didn't play as much, like didn't didn't play as focused in the first game, or they needed the first game to warm up, or they just ramped up better in the second game. And this didn't really, it wasn't really a side thing, because there was the blue side reputation, but then as Chaogu started playing more purple side games towards the end of the season, uh, they kind of lost the perfect blue side record, and they started winning more purple side games, things like this. I think it actually, there's reason to speculate that they just had a more of a preference for second game. Uh, winning second game, having warmed up, or what have you. We can look at the lane swap data also with this, because wh what I define as a lane swap is sending two people to the top lane. And Chaogu were more likely to do that in their <clears throat> first games. They were more likely to lane swap in their first game, by that I mean sending two people top. This means that they had like about 14 games, I think, where they sent two people top in their first game, and they had eight games where they sent people top in their second game. So these are, this is this is almost half, this is almost twice as much you see, and, and it might not be statistically significant, and this is why I don't necessarily think there's a super strong argument, but there is an argument to be made here for the fact that Chao Gu was deciding to lane swap almost every single first game. They lost a lot of first games because they weren't very good at it, and then they would win the second game when they wouldn't lane swap as much. So I think that you can make an argument that Chao Gu was intentionally making the decision to let's just lane swap first game. Not necessarily because, oh, it's a really bad matchup, we should lane swap just to try it, but, oh, we should always lane swap first game because we suck at lane swaps so and maybe we'll learn something. Things like this. Um, I think you can make that argument. That's an argument that can't be made. Again, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I don't think you can dismiss it completely given some of the statistical evidence.
that's, that's that's really like when you talk about experimentation i don't think you can say that lpl teams don't pick random things every once in a while that's all i call experimentation i don't think you can say that lck don't teams don't pick random things every once in a while that's all i call experimentation thoughts and theories and it's not like we're saying definitively oh this is what happened but i don't think it's easily dismissible based on the evidence so that's all i wanted to say in terms of sandbagging and experimenting from my perspective and my defense on the issue which i mean you can continue meme memeing sandbagging but saying that my analysis amounts to only saying lpl team sandbag and experiment is ridiculous i mean yeah lpl teams did poorly at worlds maybe i should have known this but we weren't the I, me personally i wasn't the only person who thought that lpl teams would do well at worlds pretty much every analyst of any region that i spoke to leading up to worlds thought that lpl teams would do well at worlds so this is all i gotta say uh layoff emily she didn't even bring up sandbagging and you know meme on actually just meme on and again like I, I don't necessarily disagree with monte cristo it would be ridiculous to say that teams were just sandbagging when they lost like that's dumb why why would i ever say that